now it's yeah now it's recording so um it's with we're with innovative pet labs and i'm dr redmond and i'm here today with with dr doug <laughs> <laughs> that's easy way yeah yeah your name isn't as easy as miller um <laughs> So um, I heard Do Dr. Doug speak at a conference and I really liked what he had to say. He seems to be on the cutting edge of some of the things that we're looking at. So um, Doug, if you want to just give a little brief bio and then we'll also include the bio um, below when we have this recorded. Sure. So my name is Dr. Doug Knieven <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I am a small animal veterinarian in Beaver, Pennsylvania. I graduated from Ohio State in 1987 from the vet school, and I've been practicing in this area of the country ever since. Um, and around 95, I got involved with holistic medicine and started doing acupuncture and herbs and eventually chiropractic and uh, just added more to my practice. And all along the way, I figured out that, you know, the gut and what's going on in the gut really makes a huge difference in what's going on in the whole body. And so that led me into research that you got the benefit of hearing when you uh, <laughs> came to my lecture. Uh, and, and so we kind of kind of went from there. And I was so excited to hear about what Innovative Pet Labs has available. I didn't know this kind of testing was available for animals. So I'm just thrilled to uh, to be part of this. Yeah, yeah, it was a good find that we found you. And <laughs> Yeah, and we've only been, you know, we haven't even been in operation for, you know, offering tests for even a year. So, oh. you know, we knew it was out there. So we just thought we'd, uh, we'd get into a little bit of information for people. So just overall, when you found, when you figured out the gut was so important, you know, why is the gut so important and what does it really, what's it do for you? Ah, for your right. Life? Well, we all know that the gut is part of absorption of nutrients, digestion of nutrients. Um, but what we're not necessarily familiar with is that 70 to 80 percent of the immune system is in the lining of the intestine. And so that means that the largest organ of the immune system is the intestine. And, and, and what is being eaten and how it is being processed and what's happening to the lining of that intestine has wide ranging effects for the immune system. And, and not only that, but there's, there's a link between the brain and the gut as well. And so, you know, we talk about um, drugs that increase serotonin in the brain to help with anxiety and, and behavior problems in animals. And it turns out that there's a lot more serotonin that's created in the gut than is created in the brain. Mm -hmm. and, and so there's this link there as well. So it's part of everything in the whole body. Yeah, yeah. So don't, it can't be underestimated. <laughs> right, right. So when we're thinking about guts and in small animals, like, so how do dogs and cats guts differ? Because we do testing for both dogs and cats. Yeah, actually, there's not a big difference as far as, you know, the kind of testing that you're doing, the, the lining of the intestine. And there's differences in some of the enzymes and so forth and, and what the animals um, are what their optimal diet is but as far as how the the intestine functions there really isn't much difference there okay yeah so inflammation is going to be inflammation exactly yeah okay yeah that you know so it yeah i think that that's there's just more research on dogs than there is yes. on cats. so you can get a lot more research and see research studies on looking at the levels of inflammation um, in dogs a lot easier than cats but it doesn't mean it's not important Dogs are just right. probably easier to use for research study. It's certainly easier to get their poop. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> dogs are always more cooperative than cats are. <laughs> so, you know, it's so frustrating for us cat owners that there isn't a lot of information out there as much on cats as there is on dogs. And, um, and so it's great that, you know, you, you have this testing available for cats as well as dogs. Yeah, I, we were we started with dogs and we were surprised at how big the cat market is. Ah. You know, and I think it's because cat mark people, you know, people who have cats are probably like, oh, no cat stuff again. So then we're <laughs> like, okay, we, we'll we'll work on it. So yeah, they and it, it comes out. So when we think about inf inflammation, so you, you mentioned the brain. Are there other areas that are associated with GI inflammation that you might see? 
Oh, well, the biggest area I would say is the skin. Whatever, you know, whenever an animal comes in with skin problems, the first thing I think of is what's going on in that gut. Okay. Because yeah. when, when the gut, the barrier isn't working properly, then again, we talked about the immune system being triggered and that can lead to allergies, which manifest on the outside of the body. Okay. Yeah. So the first place you should start is, is the gut then. Yeah. And then obviously if there's been chronic GI issues like vomiting and diarrhea, that is, is an obvious, you know, calling to, to something going on in the gut. But sometimes there can be things going on in the gut that don't manifest as obviously as, as chronic diarrhea. So just because they're not having diarrhea doesn't mean that the gut isn't the problem. Right, right. I mean, we, you know, we test for inflammation, leaky gut, digestion. And so when people ask, like, what's the ideal thing? And it's like, really, anybody, you know, mm -hmm. if, you, if you test and you find out everything's good, then you know what you're doing is working. You could also see there's low level inflammation. You know, I, I would say don't don't wait. You know, it's not just for dogs that are really sick that have, you know, mood issues or aggression or bad skin issues. It can really help you solve a lot of things. And usually if it's not the main thing, it's still contributing. Yes, I agree 100 percent from my experience. Yeah, good. <laughs> So um, when the talk that I went to that I was, you know, so excited about was you were talking about leaky gut. Now, we hear that about people um, in certain things, but, you know, it is something that can happen to dogs so, um, or cats. So, you know, can you give me a little rundown of exactly what leaky gut is and what you're looking for? Sure. So, you know, we're all familiar with the barrier of the skin. and um, it turns out that the skin barrier is several layers thick of cells, but that same barrier protects our immune system um, inside as well. I mean, there, there has to be a barrier function in the lining of the intestine in order to keep the bad stuff that's in the foods that we or our dogs are eating from getting an abnormal contact with the um, immune system. So. The weird thing is that in the gut, there's a single layer of cells that keeps the stuff from inside the gut from getting into the body. I mean, it's kind of in the body, but it's not in the bloodstream. Right, right. Yeah, that it's like within the intestinal lumen, like where, where the poop is, is really outside the body. But it's pretty phenomenal right. that it's just one layer of skin. Right. Well, epithelial cells. But yeah. in, in between the cells are these junctions called tight junctions. So that keeps those cells together in a way that doesn't allow bad stuff to get into the bloodstream or exposed to the immune system. And leaky gut is a situation where there's a breakdown in that barrier where the, the tight junctions aren't so tight anymore. And then the um, immune system can be exposed to these antigens that are in the foods that we're eating. It's not even that you're eating bad food necessarily. It's that the body is becoming um, introduced to these antigens in an abnormal way. Right. So it, you could start reacting to foods that you might otherwise, or your pet, that they might otherwise not react to. Right. And they could be perfectly healthy foods. It could be organic, you know, meals. And yet, because, because the gut isn't working properly, it can cause problems in the body. So how have you in the past, you know, so we have the zonulin test, which is one of those, you know, things that holds it together. So, um, and you can look at that in the stool. How in the past were clinicians identifying leaky gut? Guessing, <laughs> you know, it, I mean, you really trial and error. So you try different uh, supplements to heal the barrier. And if they get better, then you're, then you know that you did the right thing and that that must've been the problem. Mm -hmm. but. But yeah, that's what makes this testing so important. Not only that we can find the problem in the first place, but then follow it and make sure that, you know, we're actually, what we're doing is working. Right, right. And I would imagine that a lot of times you'll see combinations of a leaky gut and increased inflammation. Well, right. I would, from my perspective, it's oftentimes it's the inflammation that causes the leaky gut. Or it could be the other way around as well. You're almost always going to get both, I would think. 
Yeah. Yeah. I know when, when people ask which test what, should I start with if they just have to pick one? I mean, I always pick inflammation. <laughs> mm, that's a good place to start. Yeah. If you can get inflammation down. You probably, you know, yeah, it's good. It still could be other things, but probably they're less likely if you can get the inflammation um, down. So when you see a pet that might have a lot of GI inflammation or leaky gut, what kind of things do you do to get started? What do you recommend? Ah, there's a lot of things. Well, for me, the basis of health is diet. And dogs and cats did not evolve eating little processed little bits of, of kibble. So They didn't? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> in fact, you know, if you look at the teeth of the dog and compare them to the teeth of the wolf, you'll find out that they're pretty much identical. And structure dictates function. I have not had a chance to look at wolf teeth. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> Get brave. <laughs> um, but but uh, so, so I'm actually a fan of unprocessed diets for dogs and cats. So that's one place that I start with just about every case I see. Mm -hmm. And from there, if I'm suspecting leaky gut and um, issues with the intestinal lining, probiotics have been shown to be able to actually heal leaky gut. So that's a big uh, place to go. Um, and unfortunately, there's a lot of, um, there was a research study done, I believe, in 2011, where they looked at, I believe, around 32 probiotic supplements for pets, and like 95% of them either didn't have the right bacteria or didn't have the right number of bacteria, or, mm -hmm. you know, they misspelled the name of the bacteria, which was kind of a warning sign that maybe <laughs> they didn't know what was going on there. Um so, you know, getting the right supplement or even better yet, like fermented foods. You know, I was going to ask that. Way. So cats and dogs can get take fermented foods. That's that's OK for them. Yes. Yeah. You know, there's this idea that animals get diarrhea from dairy and that probably happens sometimes. But fermented dairy is something that most animals can tolerate very well. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times that'll be where where I'll start with that. So if you have somebody who just has, you know, the cheapest kibble they can find as their pet food. <laughs> How do you get them to transition their diet? How is, you know, is that a big jump? Does, you know. So there's two parts to that question. How do you convince the person to change their diet? <laughs> and then how do you get the animal to transition on the diet? So, you know, when I'm talking to the people, I, I, I kind of have this, uh, Flip an answer where where I say, can you imagine if you went to your doctor and they plopped a bag of people chow on the table and said, this is all you need to eat the rest of your life, you know, every meal just take a scoop of people chow. You know, most people can see that that doesn't make a lot of sense. Right. And, um, as far as switching the animals over, um, first of all, dogs tend to be a lot easier than cats. Okay, um, I can see that just personality wise. <laughs> right. Cats actually they they, they can become like imprinted or addicted to the shape of the food. So, so that's why they make the kibbles different shapes. Oh. They want, and the other thing is they spray the surface of the food with something called animal digest, which is similar to MSG. And I compare it to Doritos versus corn chips. <laughs> now, if I have a corn chip, it's like, okay, I could take or leave it. But Doritos. I mean, once I get that yellow stuff on my lips and in my mouth, I just can't stop, right? Yeah, yeah. I don't even and, buy those. I don't. No, I know. <laughs> so, so, so the same thing with cats. But either way, you're going to want to do a switch from processed food to raw food slowly. Uh, so, and when you, know, you say slowly, like a month, a week. So it depends on the animal. Okay, makes the, sense. You know, there are some dogs where, you know they eat a piece of chicken from the table and they get diarrhea for a week. For those dogs, you're going to probably have to take a month or two. But there's other dogs that go out, you know, and eat roadkill off the <laughs> off the street and, and not have a problem at all. You could probably switch them over within a week. And again, cats tend to take longer. So, you know, just realize that they're if you just plop it in the food bowl and expect them to eat it, that's probably not going to happen. So it and, has to be a gradual thing. Yeah. So how are there are there certain brands that you like better, or can people make their own? How, how do they get started with that? Or okay, so I'm actually not a big fan of homemade diets. Okay. Um, because many of the recipes that are available just aren't complete and balanced. 
Um, and if you're making a raw food diet, much of the meat that's for human consumption is contaminated with pathogenic bacteria like salmonella and E. coli and so forth. And, you know, the food... We're going to cook it, so... Right. They, yeah. they, they assume we're going to cook it and it won't be a problem, but for animals, it possibly could be a problem. So there are pre-made commercial raw foods out there. Um, there's a new one out called Solutions that I'm, I'm you know, really a fan of. Okay. They, they use fermentation to keep the bad bacteria out of the food. So, oh, yeah. yeah, so it's, you're kind of killing two birds with one or feeding two animals with one stone. I'm not sure. Killing doesn't sound like a good thing to do with, with food, but it, it's good in two different ways. The fact that it's raw and the fact that it has the uh, probiotics in it. Okay. Yeah. So you just kind of see if they like it and then introduce a little bit at a time. Yes. And mix it in with their regular food. And then, and then when you pick probiotics, so it doesn't sound like there's a easy way you kind of just have to trust a brand for picking probiotics or stick with right foods. um well one thing i'll say is there is the national animal supplement council nasc and this is a um uh industry group that kind of regulates what's happening with the supplement so so there's a nasc nasc seal can be put on a supplement. Okay. And what that says is that it's gone through the testing that what is on the label is what's actually in the bottle. So that would be one thing I would recommend people look for. So in, in the study you talked about that 95% of them <laughs> yes. didn't have anything, so they didn't have seals then on it or? It's, you know, I, I it's been a long time. I, I'm assuming they did not because yeah. I, I trust that this this organization is keeping. Yeah, because you know, I, I had heard that maybe in the '90s that Congress had gotten rid of all rules and regulations, really um, following what pet food companies put in their pet food. Like, I mean, I think consumer demand, but there's not a lot. Like, you could still put in a roadkill and a kibble, or right, right. So, so there's the um, uh, oh gosh, what is it? AFCO, American Association of Feed Control Officials, that, that is kind of an industry group um, that um, sets standards. Okay. But you could even have, you know, a food that passes AFCO standards that still has roadkill or euthanized pets. They've actually done studies and found traces of the drug that we use to euthanize animals in pet foods. So they just collect euthanize pets and put them wow That's so if, if on the, if yeah there should be a law right if if on the label it says meat and bone meal that's mystery meat you have no idea what that is now chicken chicken meal is chickens and beef meal is beef but meat and bone meal it's anyone's guess yeah which yeah i i wouldn't eat it <laughs> <laughs> good Good thinking. <laughs> Me yeah, either. I mean, yeah, so I wouldn't have my pet eat it. So if um, beyond like changing, you know, getting a good diet and maybe getting some probiotics, if your if your pet has other issues, is diet alone going to be it? Or are there certain supplements you try to address or you look at? Right. So um, I use a lot of Chinese herbs. Mm -hmm. So there's specific formulas that are formulated for specific Chinese conditions. Right. Um, so that would be my mm -hmm. normal and approach. Think, and and most people who, I mean, that's a big learning curve. So right. your best bet for those are to try to find somebody, a vet who has training in that. Right. But there, there are Western herbs as well. So like slippery elm bark is mm -hmm. an herb that can be used to help soothe uh, any mucous membranes, really. So the whole digestive tract. Uh, licorice is an herb that has a soothing effect on the GI tract and can help with stomach ulcers. Ginger is another one, chamomile. So there's a number of different uh, herbs that, and, and sometimes, okay, here's something interesting. There's something called pharmaco zoopharmacognosy. Have you ever heard that word? I have not heard that word. <laughs> okay, so that is the <laughs> study. Yeah, it, it's uh, yeah, a lot of letters in there. Zoopharmacognosy, 
is the study of how animals use um, plants medicinally. So if an elephant is oh, sick, wow. it might go out and eat a certain herb and, and get better. So where I'm going with this is if your animal has an upset stomach and you had some chamomile, slippery elm bark, licorice ginger available, you could put a little bit on separate plates and let them choose for themselves which one they want because their body has the wisdom to choose what their body needs. Wow. Yeah. I'm just thinking, yeah, if you could, if I could grow those in a garden and then, you know, my yeah, could go out in the garden and take what they need. So. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great if you could do that. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty good at flowers. I'm not very good at tomatoes. They say a gardener <laughs> can grow tomatoes. I haven't mastered that yet, but that would be great to have. I mean, those herbs are good for people too. Right. So, you know, then if your pets were there. So, all right, that, that's good. So are there any other things you think about when you're thinking about um, dogs with leaky gut or um, um, in, in inflammation or anything? So any? Well, you know, one thing I, I kind of touched on changing them to a raw diet, but I didn't really explain that the processing, the high heat processing of pet foods creates um, pro-inflammatory compounds in the food. And so that's one of the reasons that I get them off of processed food is because the food itself can create inflammation in the gut. Okay. Yeah. So it's really two pronged. You're getting, getting rid of things that cause inflammation and introducing things that they're more aligned with. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I think that, that makes it better. I think that's all I can think of right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not, I think it's, it can get really complicated. You know, every time I, I, I think about something, I think, oh, it can get really complicated. I'm sure there's lots of people doing their entire dissertations on this one thing, but it's really not so complicated in practice. You know, you can, you can test and see if your dog has these things. If they do, I mean, oftentimes, you know, diet's enough. And some of the papers that I've read on like calprotectin, which looks at inflammation, um, there was one from a vet school and they were saying, you know, at a certain level, you can, you know, you can change dog foods and another level, you would provide antibiotics at a third highest level, then they would give steroids. And maybe you do all those, but maybe diet alone, you know, I know with people, you can see it really high and just changing diet will bring it way down. So, um, you know, I think it's always good to start with diet. I can't imagine that you'd want to start with steroids and not change a dog's diet or a cat's Right. Diet. I would, I would hope so. And most veterinarians are of the mindset, even non-holistic veterinarians are of the mindset that the fewer medications, probably the better. And if they have to be on the medication, the lower, you know, the dose or the lower the frequency, the better. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, diet, it just makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, sol yeah, it solves a lot, <laughs> a lot of issues. All right. Well, I mean, I, I think that kind of wraps it up. We didn't have, we just kind of had a, a, a quick review um, and then just kind of going over those things. I think that's probably really helpful for most people. Good. 